Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I stand. Would you turn your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 to, uh, sorry, I'm going to read from verse 5 to 11. <clears throat> I'm going to ask if you would, if you will just stand up as I read God's word. If you will stand up with me as I read God's word. Earlier this week, I met with a couple who was able to lead a Muslim girl to, to the Lord. And what really encouraged my heart is this lady, this, this dear sister, who for the first time, I guess, has been introduced to the gospel, understands the value of the word, would ever, since then, since he came to know the Lord, would always read God's word on our knees and with much prayer. And my prayer today is, as we uh, look at God's word, that this word which is living and active would come in its transforming power into our lives, into my life, into each one of us. And, there are, and that if there is anyone here who has not been impacted by the God of the universe, who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who is... Uh, who can be your savior. May today be that day. Reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 to 11. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord, taking no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your inspired word. We thank you for the incarnate word. It's because of him, Lord, that we are where we are. And uh, we, we thank you that your spirit will help us understand. So I pray, Lord, that if in any way, if I say things which are contrary to your word, you would erase that from the minds of your children here. May it be your word that will stay and take root and grow and bear much fruit. We thank you for answering our prayers. For your glory and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our theme for the conference is Walking with Jesus. And we've been looking at the book of Ephesians. And uh, today we are at that topic where we want to see what it means to walk in the light, to walk in the light. And I'm not sure if you read the book of Ephesians. Now I want to encourage you to read the book of Ephesians at one sitting, just six chapters, just read right through. I've had the privilege to read it again and again, and I'm telling you, each time you read, there's so much more that, that you begin to see as God's Word. And the thing about Ephesians is this, that when you see the first part of Ephesians and the latter part of Ephesians, it tells you one thing, that your doctrine demands duty that your belief must behoove behavior. That means if you say this is what you believe, it must reflect in your behavior. There's no way. There's no way your behavior can be anything else. And if your behavior is not what the Bible is saying, then you need to get back to seeing what is it that the Bible is saying because the belief must behoove behavior. And that's a good test, and that's why I believe the book of Ephesians is something that you can invest your life in again and again. It's the book for the church. And so as you read the book of Ephesians, you, you see this multiple times, the word walk. That's exactly what the Lord is saying. Listen, read my lips or read my word. There is action there's things to be done. You can't just read. You can't just say, make us, uh, you know, we don't want to be uh, just listeners of the word. We want to be the doers of the word. But listen, we pray that, but we don't want to do it. But doing is something which you have to do. There's just no way. There's no excuse. 
Eleven times Paul says, therefore, and the Greek meaning for the word therefore is therefore. Consequently, if you believe this, then this must happen. Paul makes it very clear. And so it takes away every excuse that we can hold on to. We say that we're just frail, we're human. This is what the Bible says, but I can't live it. No, you can't make up your own rules. God has given us rules. God has given us word, and we're saying that this is what we need to do, all right? So as we look at that, we see Bible leaves no area of limits, there's nothing. He, they cover the life of the individual, the church, the family, the community, your professional life, every aspect Paul is saying it must seep into what has been said. So what we want to do today is to explore this phrase, walk as children of the light. We want to see what does that mean to say when we say walk? What does it mean when we say light? And how do we actually use it in our lives? How do we understand that in our lives? So when we talk about walk, walk, the one character that comes to our mind is Enoch, isn't it? Enoch. Enoch walked with God. And I'm not sure what impression or what imagery you had in your life when, we, when you think about Enoch, but... The imagery that was given to my, uh, you know, growing up, I probably was about 12 years or so, the imagery that was given to me was this, that Enoch would walk with God. They would go in a walk together. You know how we do this evening walk, right? You get out in the morning, you get out from your home, you, you know, two of you meet somewhere and you go for a walk. And then when you come back and then they ask you, like, where were you? They would say, oh, we went for a walk. So Enoch would walk with God, and he, he would go. And at one point in time, they, they got so engrossed in talking that they had walked so far away from Enoch's home, God turned around to Enoch and says, listen, you've, you've come so far away from your home, why don't you just come home with me? And so Enoch went. And that is not the biblical way. That's not the biblical way. We need to understand that, because if you would turn with me to Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 5, it'll tell you exactly what it is, because we get this understanding that, you know, walking with God is to be a recluse, a seclusion, something that you live in a monastery. It's, you know, we, we, we set aside all these uh, tasks and the chores and, and taking care of babies and changing diapers and, I don't know, going to work, paying for your mortgage. All that, if I set aside, I can walk with God. And God is saying, no, that doesn't work that way. That is not walking with God. Because we read about Enoch in Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. It says, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. He went about his living. He went about his living. He was not a reckless. So what does that really mean when, when we talk about Enoch having walked with God? And I think it's good to then turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We know about Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. It says, for, uh, you know, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But we do not read the verse just prior to that. Because in verse 5, it says that he was commended for having pleased God. He was commended for having pleased God. And then it connects with verse 6 to say that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that Enoch's walk was a walk of faith. It was a walk of faith. It was not at the exclusion of task, exclusion of chores, exclusion of the trials and difficulties that you are facing. It was a walk of faith. Now, walk with God is a favorite expression in the Old Testament. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. Abraham walked with God. We have this expression again and again. It's your faith walk. And I think sometimes we are in the danger of this evening walk with God. A danger. It may not be an evening walk, maybe a Sunday morning walk. 
We think attending a church, we made walking with God into an activity. While God is trying to tell us that it's not an activity, it's the way of life. It's your template, it's your mindset. I think the danger definitely is because we've separated our uh, secular with the sacred. I keep referring to this again and again. We, we create this distinction. The things that we can do in church and the things that we can do out of church, outside of church. The things that I can do on a Sunday and the things that I can, I can do outside of Sunday. I was talking to our dear brother yesterday and he was saying that your living must start Sunday afternoon. Preparing for Sunday morning must start Sunday afternoon. I think the worst thing is because, you know, because we've created this distinction between the secular and the sacred, the secular seems to be seeping into our sacred. Our mindsets, the way we think, is being regulated by the worldview. And we think we can bring those things into the world, in, into the word. And we have a problem. That's a problem. It's a danger. I want to quote to you a research by Barna Group that indicates to us that we are in desperate times. Less than 1% of young adult population in the United States have, has a biblical worldview. Less than 1%. Uh, less than 0.5 Christians between the age of 18 to 23 has a biblical worldview. And this is how Barnard defined what a worldview is. Six Indications. One is that there is absolute moral truth, that absolute moral truth exists. The Bible is completely inerrant. The sat Satan is real being, not symbolic. Person can earn his way into the kingdom of God through good works or cannot, uh, cannot earn his way. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth. God is supreme creator of the heavens and the earth and reigns over the whole universe today. Those six things that we hold sacred, only less than 0.5% of our young people between 18 to 23 believe as Christians. We have to be careful how we live our lives. Living and walking with God is agreeing with him. This consistent, constant agreement. What he calls good, we call good. What he calls evil, we call evil. We, he, has the, he, he, he calls the shots. That our worldview is compatible with his word view. Our, our, our um, it, it, the conduct is compatible with his character. We might think, yeah, I agree with all of those six things that he read out. But I want us to pause just that little long and say, is my life compatible? Is my conduct compatible with the character? The things that I think. My wife and I were talking the other day about, you know, growing up, our parents would not allow us to watch movies. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to get into that debate whether, you know, watch movies or not. That's not the idea here because I watch movies and I'm discerning about movies, so that is not the point. But the point is this, that what feeds you fuels you. You invest your time watching something and doing something, that is what feeds you. The worldview that we started to think is no more biblical. We live in a post-Christian world. And that's where the danger is. That's where the danger is. A walking with God, as Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, is to set our minds on high in the heavenly places. To set our minds on heavenly places. Many times we've been said, don't be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. We've heard that, right? 
But you know something what the Bible is saying? You can be of no earthly good if you're not heavenly minded. You have to be heavenly minded. It's you who have experienced God's forgiveness, God's love, who have had this template that the world doesn't have. Only you, when you are heavenly minded, only then can you be of any earthly good. Only then can you be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the city on a hill that cannot be hid. We are to have the heavenly minded. We are to have this altogether new sensitivity to sin. I want to read to you a quote by Roy Heisen, The Calvary Road. Millions of book, millions of that book are in print. I want to urge you to read that book, The Calvary Road by Roy Heisen. The Calvary Road. Let me read to you what he writes in his introduction. He says, I learned and saw that revival is first personal and immediate. It is constant experience of the simplest Christian who walks in the light. I saw that walking in the light means an altogether new sensitivity to sin, a calling things by their proper name of sin, such as pride, hardness, doubt, fear, self-pity, which are often passed over as human reaction. It means a readiness to break and confess the fear of him who was broken for us, for the blood does not cleanse excuses, but it always cleanses sin confessed as sin. We are extremely gracious with ourselves. We excuse bad behavior, bad conduct, bad thinking, bad... You can fill in the blank, whatever it is, and say that's all right. God understands. God does not understand sin. He cannot take excuse. We want to walk in the light. We want to walk with him. Amos 3.3 says, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? You are not walking with God if you're not in agreement with him. For one, for, for one walking with God, I, I just do want to say what walking with God is not, what walking is not, right? I mean, walking is is not rituality. It's not rituality. It's spirituality, but not rituality. It is not just this outer conformity. We, we think that if you have pleased people and they've started to respect you because of your position, because of the way you carry yourself, that I got this tie and this pocket square and all that, look good on the outside, and you think, well, let's give them some respect. Now, I think I carry this on to God, that God would be okay. He, you know, I fooled him, and it doesn't work that way. It's not rituality. It's spirituality. It is, it is not cultural. It's convictional. It's not cultural. It's convictional. Ed says, uh, he's, he, in an article in Christianity Today, he says Christian, Christians can be divided into three types. There are cultural, there are congregational, and there are cul convictional. Cultural, congregational, and convictional. The cultural Christians are, are, are those who were born in a Christian family. They were raised in church. And because of heritage, they think they are Christians. And then there are the congregational who start to come to church regularly. They are there for every activity. Everything seems to be uh, good. But it's the convictional, the ones who have been transformed from the inside out who we see as ones who are walking as children, children of light. And so Paul is very insistent that we walk. He is insistent. So, you know, six times, six times in this book, that's a study you can do. I like giving homework. So when you go, when you go back home and look for those six walks, read through. Uh, and, and chew on the card, as, as it were, of the, of the word that came to you the, over the weekend about how we ought to walk, and in this case, walk as the children of light. So that was walk. Let's get to light. And as light, 
we, we see that light can be divided into uh, the way the scripture shows us is in this physical realm, the dimension, the, the moral dimension, and the spiritual dimension. And I want to quickly go through that uh, so that we get this fair idea. The physical, the moral, the, the spiritual. The physical dimension, the first act of God in creation is creating this distinction between light and darkness. We read that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that light was good, and God separated light from darkness. Job 26.10, he has inscribed a circle on the face of the water at the boundary between light and darkness. The physical dimension shows to us that light and darkness cannot be together. They must be separated. And then you have the moral dimension, which, which is the dimension of good and evil. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 13 and verse 12. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The works of darkness must be put off and the, and, and the armor of light must be put on. The, the essential component of the separation of light and darkness even in the moral aspect. So we read, do not be unequally yoked, for what fellowship does light have with darkness? Then we get to the spiritual dimension. And the spiritual dimension, again, we can see that in three ways. The scripture, the, uh, uh, the son of God, and, and then we can see it as a salvation. Scripture is Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And salvation, salvation. You see, it's, I, I look at salvation and I think about 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, For God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shown in, the, in our heart to show the light of the knowledge of the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ. What it says is it's a new, new genesis in the life of that person. What happened in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 is what happens in the life of a Christian, of the sinner who becomes a saint when he comes to know Jesus Christ. And then we have the Son of God who's personified as a light, doesn't he? The Simeon's prayer, when he prays, he says in Luke chapter 2, verse 32, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. To your people, Israel. But then when the Lord Jesus Christ stands up on the day after the great feast, the feast of the tabernacles or the booths, he says, I'm the light of the world. And the context is so beautiful because on the last day of that, of that feast, there is this giant menorah or the, or the lamp that is lit that lights up the whole of Jerusalem. And on the next day, Jesus stands and says, listen, this light lit up just Jerusalem. And I was pr Simeon's prayer was that he would be a light to his people in Israel. But I want to tell you, he, I am, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, the light of the world is the light of the world. And so, as children of the light, we have to walk in light. The distinctions between good and evil, between, you know, sacred and sacred is only the options that we have. No one among you who works as a doctor or as a nurse, or I can't even think of any jobs right now, but you know what I'm talking about. There's no secular. You're not on a secular job. So that brings us to the passage that we have. That was just my introduction, but I hope you're with me. Three things I want to bring to you very quickly. From verse 9, I want to talk to you about the fruitfulness of light. Verse 10, I want to talk to you about the faithfulness of light. And verse 11, I want to talk to you about the fellowship of light. The fruitfulness, faithfulness, and fellowship. I want you to know that in fruitfulness, in the first in verse 9, which says, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true, the character of light is that it causes to bear fruit. 
the character of light. It's because of light that fruit is born in us, and it's, you know, we see the connection. And, and it's good, uh, out there it says, what is good, right, and true. Allow me to uh, suggest that the goodness is about moral excellence. It's about my relationship with the other person. How do I deal with you? the horizontal plane, and then you have the righteousness which deals with this, with the vertical plane to do with God. And then you have the truth which talks to us about the integrity, the honesty, the structural integrity of your heart. And what I have here for you, brothers and sisters, what God has for us here is that when we walk in the light, the fruit would be evident in my life. It's transformational. It's for me, the horizontal plane and also the vertical plane. We were talking about it at the youth meeting yesterday. We were saying that, listen, if you were to say that you love God and you hate his bride, it's not possible possible. Love for God and love for his saints must come together. It must be self-evident. So fruitfulness, fruitfulness, good, righteousness, and truth. And I just love the way the Spirit of God uses word. You know, the use of word. He calls the, the fruit, which is living, to do with the word. Even in Galatians, it's the fruit of the Spirit. But when he talks about darkness, it's the works of the darkness. It's like iron works, steel works, they're dead. It's something that man does. But you have fruit and you have works. What we have here is fruit, it's the result of life. And so as the children of light, we have to demonstrate the fruit of the light demonstrate the fruit of the light. And then you have faithfulness in verse 10. And to try to discern, prove what is acceptable or pleasing unto the Lord. It's the character of the light to be faithful. Light can only be light. It doesn't get up on a, on, a, on a day and the light doesn't get up on a day and say, I got off the wrong side of the bed so I can be a little dark today. We give ourselves those excuses, do we not? How can we, as children of the light, we need to be faithful to what he calls us. Light is dependable. It's true to its character. In fact, God, in trying to explain to us his character, he shows us the character of light. And let me read to you from 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. James chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of shadow or uh, due to change. God is who he says he is. No change, no variation, no mask. that we are to be who God says we are to be, his children, that we walk in light. We are to test, to scrutinize, to prove, to see that our life is lived faithfully, is lived faithfully, because we are to demonstrate the character of God. Because we saw, as in the life of Enoch, it's faithfulness that pleases God. It's faith that pleases God. You want to please God, discerning what is pleasing to God, then it's your faith, your trust. And I'll tell you, I was fretting, standing outside. I have, I'm using this iPad, a technology, which I thought it might just not work when I come up on stage. And I'd forgotten, forgot to bring my paper notes. And I was standing there, and I, I was just saying, listen, I, I you know, uh, I, I don't know whether I can even go in without my notes. And I think I ha as I was praying, as a brother prayed with me, I was convicted, saying that, why am I not l able to live, trust God in that faith that this will work? As simple as that. 
as simple as that. I didn't kill anybody or murder or do any of those big things. It's the little things that we often take, don't trust God. And he says it doesn't please him when we don't put our faith in him. Demonstrate the fruit of the light, discern the pleasure of the Lord. Verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. It's about fellowship or lack of fellowship because light is divisive. Light comes on, darkness flees. There's no, like, let's have a committee meeting together for some time. Let's negotiate. There's no negotiation. It exposes. And as children of light, we are to disavow the works of darkness, disavow the works of darkness. So as children of light, we are to be fruitful, we are to be faithful, and we are to be discerning about our fellowship. We are children of light. I just love the way this chapter begins. It begins by saying, be imitators of God. As children of God, <clears throat> we are to be imitators of God. When I go visit my parents, and I walk down the street in, in Kerala, they, people looking at me will say, hey, you must be Elias' son. I say, yeah, I am. They've never stopped me to say, you must be the Queen of England's son. I don't know if they, you've had that experience, but never. They know whose you are because something about me, the way I look, the way I dress, the way I talk, I don't know what it is, but they know whose son I am. And so why is it that the world looking at us cannot see that we are the children of the light? Why? Why? That we would be imitators of God. God gives an example of someone who did not walk in the light, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. You know, in John chapter 13 and verse 30, it says Jesus, uh, Judas sorry, took the piece of bread and went out immediately, and now it was night. John puts that in in parenthesis. It's, it's in parenthetical, uh, it is light, not to show us that uh, listen, let me tell you, it is, you know, 10 o'clock in the night or whatever, or that, you know, it's not a time indicator. It could be, but there is more to it because there begins the process where, from the denial to, to the crucifixion. He stumbled in the dark. John eleven ten says, but if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And so I pray, dear brothers and sisters, I pray that this is not true of us. I had a responsibility to bring you the word, and you've heard the word. You will be held responsible with what you do, with the authoritative, the flawless, infallible, powerful word of God. Darkness must flee. But it's also interesting how Paul connects our individual life as he begins with the life of the church. In fact, I, I want to give you another homework. I just get excited when I start to give homework. Uh, Paul actually talks about seven different mysteries, not just in Ephesians, but in his epistles. Seven different mysteries, at least seven. I counted you. You can send me an email on that if you find more, but I found at least seven Seven different mysteries, and I want you to go and, and find them out. That's good research. In, jo in sorry, Ephesians chapter 3, we read about the mystery of the church, the mystery of the church. And so, uh, Constable, this is what he says about Ephesians. He says, this is the most important exposition 
on, God, on the Lord's most important statement while he was on the earth, Matthew 16, 18, I will build the church. I will build the church. So it's about how we, when we come together as a church, how are we going to be fruitful, faithful, and what kind of fellowship do we keep? I understand in our, now when we talk about church that we, 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 there, is, there are things happening on the outside and things happening on the inside. You know, we looked at research and we saw that, you know, even, even within the local churches, it's possible that people have varying degrees of their understanding and sometimes they're heretical. And as, and as elders, we have such responsibility to bring in God's word. In Toronto, we are dealing with, uh, we, we're not dealing, sorry, but there is a church that is debating, debating whether they should keep an openly atheistic minister as their pastor. Openly atheistic, devows, uh, disavows God's word, doesn't believe in God, and they're debating whether he, she should continue as a pastor who came out as a gay some years ago. There is an article, I'm not sure whether you read, but in Israel, in Haifa, there was, a, there was one person who, who brought in a case before uh, the judge trying to get a restraining order on God because God has not been kind on him. I chuckled too. It was like, really? But you know something? We think that we are in times which is very sad or we are fast going down a slippery slope. But I want to tell you, even when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, it was, the context was the same. It wasn't very different. There, was, there were problems in the church, prob problems out of the church, outside of church. And, and so, as we as individuals, we check our lives and we come to church and we get actively involved, work with our sleeves rolled up, Because sometimes we think of ourselves as churches, as gas stations. We want a good sermon, fill me up, energize me so I can go into the world. Or we want like a movie theater, you want entertainment. Or you think it is like a, you know, a retail store, like a superstore or whatever, one stop, I'll get it all. I want something for my kids, I want something for my youth, I want something for my wife, I want something, you know, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. But church is not you want. I hope you understand that. Ephesians is trying to tell us just that. That we would be laboring, co-laboring with God as this dwelling place is being built for him. And I'll read to you a quote by Barnhouse. When Christ was in the world, he was like the shining sun. When the sun sets and the moon comes up, the moon is a picture of believers, the church. The church shines, but not with its own light. It shines with reflected light. Our light does not originate with us. Our job, like the moon, is to reflect light. If we do not, then things can really be dark. What is the only reason the moon does not reflect the light of the sun? The only reason. Only an eclipse. When the world gets in the way, and we stop reflecting when the world blocks our way. And my prayer goes very specially for elders because Hebrews 13 and 17 reminds me that we are to guard over the souls of those he has given us, to guard over the souls, for we have to give an answer to God. And so when I try to 
do something or when you as elders have to do something, let it not be because we have not walked as children of light. We have learned to, dis we, have, we have shown, exhibited, demonstrated the fruit. We have learned to discern what is pleasing in our faithfulness. We have disavowed the darkness. We want to do nothing with it. Do not make it about you, brothers, because eldership is not a title. It's not a position. It's a minister that you would serve the flock. They would be fed the whole counsel of God. I dread. I have stayed awake nights wanting to run away, not be uh, 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 under shepherd, as you begin to recognize the immense responsibility of eternal souls that you're asked to guard, and only through his strength. But as I walk as a children, as a child of light, we call to be fruitful, faithful, and to show fellowship. What I'd like to do is I'm going to read to you the prayer of Paul from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. And those of you who can, please would you rise with me as I pray this prayer for all of us. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. If you will rise with me, those of you who can. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.